<laughs> well, guys, we are glad you are here. My name is Brian Osborne. Call me Mr. Osborne, Mr. Brian. Either way is fine. I am from Answers in Genesis. Have you guys heard of Answers in Genesis? And like Mr. Ken Ham. I watch him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely good stuff. The uh, we are from we're a ministry that wants to defend God's word because it's under attack today. And we do all sorts of stuff to defend the word of God. We go, we speak at churches like this one. We travel around literally the world, talking to all sorts of people everywhere about dinosaurs and rock layers and fossils, the age of the earth and stuff like that. We also have a museum in northern Kentucky, really close to Cincinnati. Have you heard about that? Some of you have. Anybody been? Just curious. I have a couple. All right, very good. Well, uh, I'm going to show you a little video about the museum to kind of give you a better idea about who we are. Okay, so this is a clip about the Creation Museum we have in northern Kentucky. And before I do this, though, let me just give you my ground rules, okay? As we get into this talk, I have rules. Like every good teacher, we got some rules. My first rule is, you guys ready? Eyes up here. Don't drop anything on the floor. My second rule is, don't drop anything on the floor. My third rule is, don't drop anything on the floor. My fourth rule is, guess what? You guys got it. Nicely done. All right. My fifth rule is, if you have to go to the restroom, don't. Unless you're about to explode and be a hazard to people around you. If that's the case, tell an adult they will help you. Okay? And then my next rule is, please don't talk unless I ask you to. Because I want to be sure that everybody can hear what I'm saying. Because we have some really important stuff to say. And then the last thing is this. There will be times where I ask you to talk to me. I want you to give me an answer, to yell back at me. There will be times where I ask you to raise your hand. So when I do that, I really want you guys to get involved. But just limit your talking to those times. All right? But let's practice to see how good you are. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. You ready? One. Two. Wait for it. Three. <laughs> That's not bad. Let's, try. let's do it one more time. One, two, three. Okay, nice sound effects. All right, yeah. Good job, guys. All right, here is the video clip of the museum. I think those ground rules are late. Here you go. The acclaimed Creation Museum and Outreach of Answers in Genesis is a one of a kind museum filled with animatronic characters, interactive videos, a spectacular planetarium, a special effects theater, and many other world class exhibits. Since its opening in 2007, the Creation Museum has welcomed over 1.5 million guests at its 49-acre location in the greater Cincinnati area. The state-of-the-art 70,000-square-foot museum brings the pages of the Bible to life, helping answer the skeptical questions that cause people to doubt that the Bible is true. The dramatic finale of the museum is the last Adam film where guests experience the glory of God's redemptive plan and hear a clear and powerful presentation of the gospel message. Since the museum's opening, we have heard countless testimonies from adults and young people whose lives have been changed through a museum visit. Now discover how it might change your own life for Christ. Plan your visit at creationmuseum.org and prepare to believe. Stuff at the museum. It really is an awesome place to go to. Me and my wife loved going to the museum before I joined the ministry full time. We're also building, you may have heard as a ministry, we're building Noah's Ark, a full size replica of Noah's Ark. And that's coming in about a year, so keep your eyes open for that. It's going to be incredible. But at the museum, guys, at the ministry, we love dinosaurs. They're just awesome. And if you come into the museum, as you roll in the gate through the front gate, you'll see a stegosaurus as part of the entrance to the museum. Once you walk inside, there's a big apatosaurus on the top right hand corner there. Uh, that moves around, it's animatronic. Here's a velociraptor as you go through the museum. Here's one that's animatronic, it moves around. It'll bite at you, which is pretty scary, but it won't hurt, not much. And then <laughs> during Christmas time, you can walk through the gardens. We have dinosaurs lit up all over the place. Here's a lit up T-Rex about to eat my wife and my mother-in-law. It's kind of scary, but there he is, okay? We have this fossil called Ebenezer in the museum, and Ebenezer is an Allosaurus fossil, literally one of the best fossils of an Allosaurus in the entire world. God has blessed us with it. Really neat story about how we got that. And the name Ebenezer has a biblical reference, not the Christmas story one. I personally love dinosaurs. Uh, as far as I know, me and my wife, we made this a couple years ago. This is the first ever snow wreck that I've ever seen. All right? <laughs> we made that together because we love dinosaurs. We're teaching our son Ian to love dinosaurs as well. He's got a little pet dinosaur down there he plays with. We love dinosaurs. We're going to talk about those today. But before we jump into those, that subject about dinosaurs, I want to ask you guys a couple questions. Have you guys ever heard 
of evolution. Will you raise your hand if you've heard of evolution? Everybody, for the most part. Okay, how many of you have heard that people evolved from ape-like creatures? Have you ever heard that? Raise your hand. Wow, okay. Have you heard that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Wow, look at that. I hope everybody takes note of that. This teaching is so prevalent in our culture. And guys, those ideas have caused many people to doubt the Bible and turn away from God, which is so sad. But what I want to tell you up front is that we at Answers in Genesis do not believe in evolution. We don't believe that life came from nothing billions of years ago. We think God created everything. You see, the evolutionists believe everything came from nothing and organized itself all by itself. And I mean, when you came to this building today, you didn't look at this building and say, wow, look what happened when you put a bunch of dynamite under some bricks and blow it up. All right? Is that how you got this building? No. no. Right? Of course, we know there are people who designed and built this building, right? Well, think about it. Your brains, your bodies are so more complex than this building. Someone had to design it. Someone had to make it. That someone is God. He created you in his image. And that's why you have value. You see, we don't believe the dinosaurs of millions of years ago. We don't believe in evolution. I mean, think about it. Was this your grandpa? <laughs> that's not your grandpa? What? Was this your grandma? I'm just curious. I didn't know. <laughs> hey, now I did notice when you guys walked in today, you walked in like this. Did y'all walk in like this? Are you sure? I thought you did. Okay. No, you didn't walk in like that. No, you are not an ape. You're very, very different. You have a lot of differences between us. There are a lot of differences between us and apes and gorillas and so forth. What is that? Let's do a test. Our hands and feet are very different from apes. Take, hold your hands up like this. I want you to take your thumb and touch it to your pinky. Can you do that? All right, very good. Most of you can. Okay. I think everybody can. All right, very good. Now, I want you to do another test. Inside of your shoe, don't take your shoe off. I want you to take your big toe and touch it to your pinky toe. <laughs> Hopefully you can't do that. If you can, we got issues, okay? <laughs> but you know what? Apes can because they have really weird feet to us, but their feet are made to grab a hold of limbs and swing around, which we think is cool, and it is cool, but your feet are different. Your feet are made to run, to jump, to skip, and to dance, and do all sorts of really cool things that they cannot do. We are very different from the apes. And if you think about it, another big difference is humans, we, we can think, we can build stuff, we can make computers, we can do all sorts of really neat things to draw and make song and music. The only thing the ape can think about is a what? Banana. Banana, right? Which are good. I like bananas, don't get me wrong, but we are very, very different. You see, here's the thing. I don't believe in evolution millions of years ago. Why? Because I believe the Bible. You see, the Bible is a very special and unique book. You see, the Bible claims to be the very word of God. This is God's revelation to us. And you know what? He tells us how everything began in his book. And so, what in fact, what we like to call the Bible in Answers of Genesis is the history book of the universe. Let's say that together. The history book of the universe. That's not bad. Good job, guys. And what we're going to see here today, guys, is that when you start with the Bible, you have answers with that history to the world around you. You have answers even about dinosaurs. And we're going to see those answers today when we talk about dinosaurs. How do you explain dinosaurs from the Bible? That's what you're going to see right now. We summarize dinosaurs with what we call the seven F's and answers in Genesis, okay? So I'm going to show you the word, I'm going to say the word, and then we'll, I'll say it a second time and you say it with me, okay? We'll go through the seven F's one at a time, then we'll break it down individually. So, the Bible says this, the seven F's, they were formed on day six. Say formed. 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 And then fearless. 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 And then fallen. Say fallen. 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 Alright? And then flood. 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 And then faded. Faded. And then found. Found. Then there was fiction. Fiction. And by the way, what does fiction mean? Just yell it out. Fiction. Not true. What does fiction mean? Not true. What does fiction mean? Not true. Good job. Is that great? Not true. Remember that for later on. So that's the last of the seven F's. So we're going to go through each one of those. So let's talk about the first one. They were formed. What were they? Formed. formed. Good job. Now, the Bible says that God made everything in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, which is why we have a seven-day week. I'm just curious. At your house, does anybody practice a nine-day week? A couple of hands. Daddy does. <laughs> anybody practice an 11-day week? Anybody? 
No, you should all practice a seven-day week. Why? Because God made everything six days and rested on the Sabbath. And that's the only place we get that from is the Bible. That's the only place we get the idea from. And the Bible tells us that God made animals from the earth, but then he made man in his own image. You see, we are very different from the animals. You are not just an animal. Is that a surprise to you? I hope not. Maybe your parents. I don't know. But you are not just an animal. Say that with me. You are not just an animal. No, you are made in God's image. As a matter of fact, God made us to rule over the earth and the animals to take care of them. And when he made the animals, God brought the animals to Adam to name them. And so he's naming the animals. And as Adam was naming the animals, he noticed something. And God wanted him to notice this. And that's Adam noticed there was a male and female T-Rex, and there was a male and female deer, and there was a male and female gorilla. But as he was looking around, there was no Mrs. Adam. There was nobody like him. I mean, he didn't look at a chimp and say, well, that's close enough, I'll date her. Right? No, there was nobody like him. And, and God did that for a reason. So God put Adam to sleep, took out his rib, and made a woman. And when Adam woke up, he said, wow. Which is southern from bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, all right? But he's saying that's awesome. She was taken from me. She is like me. And this is, according to the Bible, the first marriage. And marriage is between a man and a woman because God made a man and a what? And a woman. And he made marriage. He tells us what it is. And as Adam did all this, he found his wife and he named them. And then I want you to look at these pictures, though, in the background. Something interesting. What is in the background of this picture? What's hanging down from the top? What is that? It's a dinosaur. What's in the picture here? Another dinosaur. This is, then what's in the background here? Dinosaurs. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Osborne, are you telling me that dinosaurs live with man? Well, does the Bible tell us when God made dinosaurs? Which day? Yeah, very good. How do you know? Well, if you look at this picture, there are two T-Rexes in that picture. That proves it, right? <laughs> Why do we put two T-Rexes in that picture? Because here's the thing. Although the Bible doesn't tell us specifically when God made the T-Rex, God does tell us he made land animals on day six. True? And is the T-Rex a land animal? Yes, he is. So that means he was made on day six, right? It's not hard to figure out. Plus, we got proof positive that uh, Adam lived with dinosaurs. Here's a picture that Eve took in the garden, just in case you ever wondered. All right? Uh, if there were newspapers around, that might have said something like this. Wow, dinosaurs made on day six. Isn't it awesome? And for the parents, that's back when newspapers told the truth. But anyway, that's a different thing. Um, so Adam and Eve, they lived with dinosaurs. It was awesome back in the day. People say, well, how long ago was that? Well, if you add up the genealogies in the Bible, which is the biblical family trees, the father, son, age groups, you get an age of the earth for around 6,000 years. That means dinosaurs lived with man around 6,000 years ago. You might say, but wait, Mr. Osborne, so many secular scientists say, but dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Now, here's what I want you to do. Next time you read something like that or you hear something like that, I want to teach you a lesson. I want to teach you a question to ask when you hear that, okay? We're going to go to the book of Job. And in the book of Job, God is basically telling Job, Job, I'm God. Look how powerful I am. Trust me. I've got this. I'll take care of you. Put your faith in me. Even if you don't understand, Job, I've got you. I'm going to take care of you. And so he's showing Job his creative power. Then he asks Job a question. He says, Job... Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, Job, were you there when I created everything? And was Job there? No. Now, was anybody there? No. No, because who's the only person who has lived for eternity? God. Just God. He is all powerful. He made everything. No one was there when he made it. Only God. At a point, he was asking us, Job, were you there? To remind Job, he wasn't. And to remind Job that he is God, he tells us how he did it. Right? So the next time someone says to you that the earth is millions of years old or dinosaurs lived millions of years ago or this thing is millions of years old, blah, 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 I want you to respond with a question. I want you to ask it nicely and politely, but truthfully. I want you to ask them this. Um, excuse me, sir, ma'am. Were you there? So practice that with me. Say it together. Ready? Were you there? One more time, a little louder. Were you there? Very good. Now, I've had people come back to me and say, but Mr. Osborne, I asked my teacher that. I said, were you there? And they said, no, I wasn't, but you weren't either. What do I say now? You know what you say then? You say, you're right, I wasn't there, but I've got a book from someone who was. Would you like to read it? And that book is called The Bible, because only God has always been there. And he tells us how he did it. And, you know, here's the thing we have to remember, boys and girls, is this, is that has any human or scientist always been there? Yes or no? 
No. Does any human or scientist know everything? Yes or no? No. no. Who's the only person who has always been there and knows everything? God. So who do we listen to first? God or man? God. Always God first. Exactly right. Did my mic dial on me? By chance? Is that it up? You still kind of hear me. That's not as good. Let me check this real quick. Am I back? Can you hear me now? Old commercial. Hello, hello, hello. I think my power's okay. I'm going to try it again. See what happens. Okay. Sorry, guys. Oh. Yeah, you're awake now, aren't you? All right. <laughs> All right. But okay, so yeah. So we listen to God. <laughs> That's not funny. Hey, I'll keep going because I think they can hear me. I'll let you play with it. But um, if you guys can't hear me in the back, let me know. I'll speak up a little louder because I can't do that. But so we know that dinosaurs live with man because God made land animals on day six. That means even things like the great stegosaurus lived with Adam and Eve. You guys like the stegosaurus? Yeah. yeah. What about the bronchiosaurus? That lived with them too, like the bronchiosaurus? Yeah. All right. Now, hands down. Um, I'm going to show you next my favorite dinosaur. On the count of three, I want you to yell out what you think it is, and I'll show you. You ready? One, two, three. Yeah, yeah you guys know it. The T-Rex is my favorite animal. Why? Well, let's look at those teeth. All right? He's my favorite dinosaur. Anyway. But anyway, yeah, love the T-Rex. T-Rex, they lived with man. And some may say, but wait, Mr. Osborne, if dinosaurs were created with man, then why don't we see the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, we don't see the word dinosaur in the Bible. But you know why? Because it's a very new word. It's actually newer than the word computer. It was not invented until 1841. Say 1841. 1841. That's a long time ago. Invented by a guy named Sir Richard Owens. It means terrible lizard. So, of course, you don't expect to find the word dinosaur in the older English Bibles. The word was not even invented yet. But there is another word in those older English Bibles that appears to be talking about dinosaurs in many cases. And that word is something that might surprise you. It's dragons. It's translated from the Hebrew word tanim. It's repeated over 25 times throughout the Old Testament. One example, Psalm 74, 13, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Maybe you're talking about like the chronosaurus, that big old critter, or the plesiosaurus, something like that. But there's also a couple places in the Bible where it looks like God is talking about dinosaurs in a lot of the tell. In the book of Job, chapter 40, God tells Job to look at behemoth. Now, behemoth is a fun word. It just means a monstrous beast. But let's say behemoth together. Behemoth. Yeah, it's just a fun word to say. I like it. It's a guy word. Behemoth, all right? And so, if you got a Bible with some footnotes or study notes, it might tell you that behemoth was possibly a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if the description there fits a hippo or an elephant. So, we look there at verse 16. It says, what strength he has in his hips, what power in the muscles of his belly. Notice behemoth has a really big belly. And no one argues. Elephants, they do. They've got big bellies, right? Look at that belly. <laughs> Hippos have big bellies. That's a big belly. He's got a bigger belly. He wins. That's all I'm saying. All right? Everybody's got big bellies. But then, in verse 17, it goes on to say, behemoth, his tail sways like a cedar. What it means is his tail sways like a cedar tree. You ever seen a tree sway in the wind? How big and huge they are. They lumber back and forth, gigantic. That's the way Behemoth's tail was. So let's look at the tail of an elephant. Wow, look at that cedar tree. Isn't that impressive? There's a couple of cedar trees. There's a whole herd of cedar trees. And there's a cedar tree, there's a cedar tree. Here's a couple other cedar trees. Do you think Behemoth was an elephant? No. No. So he must be a hippo, right? Let's look at the tail of a hippo. That must be like a cedar tree. Look at those cedar trees. There's another one, and another one, and another one. Are either of those cedar trees? No. no those are not tree tails. Those are what I like to call twig tails. They're not tree tails, okay? You put a tree tail, you put it on a hippo, and that's what you get. <laughs> All right? Put it on an elephant. No, that's not working out either. You put it on a long-necked dinosaur, like a sauropod dinosaur, a brachiosaurus, a patasaurus, titanosaurus. That seems to fit the description really well. And that leads me to a really important side note. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if your Bible has study notes, that's all well and good. But let's remember that the footnotes in your Bible are not the inspired Word of God. The text itself is the inspired Word of God. And actually, I've heard it put like this. You don't use your footnotes to understand your Bible. Use your Bible to understand 
footnote. That's a cool thing to keep in mind for later on. And it goes on to say in verse 18, his bones are like tubes of bronze, ribs are like rods of iron. And there's the toe bone of a brachiosaurus. Look at that. There's the leg bone of a brachiosaurus. And it says he ranks first among the ways of God. This is the biggest example of God's creative power for Job to see. And from all of that, this is what seems to be being described. Look at that. Something like a brachiosaurus. Notice the size. And watch the tail sway back and forth like a tree in the wind, right? And of course, what movie does this come from? Jurassic Park, yes. And so uh, be careful when you watch those. But uh, yeah, it's a good example of behemoth right there. And then we have another creature mentioned in the book of Job. He's called Leviathan. Now, Leviathan is very interesting. Leviathan is described as being powerful and aggressive. And again, God tells Job to look at him. He's a real critter. But then there's some interesting things about Leviathan. It says that lights shoot out of his mouth. And sparks shoot out from his mouth. Smoke pours out of his nostril. His breath sets coals ablaze. And flames dart from his mouth. So now it's not just a dragon, but it's a fire-breathing dragon. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Osborne, what are you telling me? That there were fire-breathing dragons? Isn't that impossible? But before we think that's impossible, let's take a look at what God did to the little bombardier beetle. No, to scientists, it's the bombardier beetle. When threatened, it fires out a burning liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, almost boiling point. It does it by pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites the mixture. The burning chemicals have nowhere to go but out and with a bang. Okay, so that little critter basically shoots out liquid fire out of his bomb. <laughs> he can do it up to 70 times in a row. He's called the Rambo of the insect world. It kills other insects, small mammals, and is harmful to human skin. If God can do that with a little two-inch beetle, what can he do with a multi-ton beast? Right? And then think about things like lightning bugs, critters that can make light. Anybody like lightning bugs? Raise your hand. Yeah, aren't they cool, right? You can play with them, do all sorts of great stuff with lightning bugs. But they're amazing because they make light. And the, in, the conversion that they go through to produce light is 100% efficient. No energy is lost in the process. Our lights lose 90% of their energy in the form of heat. And what about electric eels? Animals that can produce electricity. How cool is that? And if you just found the bones of an electric eel, would you know it produced electricity? No, probably not. Plus, besides all that, most animals produce methane, which is a flammable gas. All you need is a way to ignite it if you've got a flamethrower. Not that hard to do. Also, the Bible sees flying fiery serpents mentioned a couple of different times in Isaiah. And so, literally, that might be the Ramphorhynchus or something like that, or Pterodon or Pterodactyl mentioned in the Bible as well. And so, they're all over the place. And people say, but wait, Mr. Osborne, if that's true, then don't you think Adam even would get a little worried when lunchtime rolls around? All right, what did the dinosaurs eat? Especially the T-Rex with those big old teeth. And that's a good question. That's fair. What did the first T-Rex eat? The first one. Don't answer it yet, but the very first one that God made. Was he originally a plant eater, meat eater, scavenger, or plant and meat eater? On the count of three, yell out your answer. One, two, three. I heard all kinds of stuff. You guys are going to make up your mind. <laughs> no. All right? The correct answer is plant eater. You say, what? How do you know that? Well, because the Bible tells me so. And that leads us to the next F. Dinosaurs were initially fearless. Say fearless. Yes. Fearless. So the first F. What was the first F? Do you remember? They were formed. Good job. The next F? Fearless. fearless. Say the first one again. Formed. Formed. The second one? Fearless. Fearless. Very good. You see, in Genesis 1.29, a really cool thing is told to us. God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. And then in verse 30, it says, To all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the air, every creature with a breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. You see, originally, originally everything was vegetarian. Originally everything ate plants. And you say, how do you, well, okay, but why? Well, because remember, God looked down on day six and called everything very good. And you see, God would not call death very good. You see, the Bible makes it clear that God made a perfect creation. There was no death, no pain, no suffering, no homework. Oh, there might be homework. But, it, you know, <laughs> it was a perfect creation. And God told Adam, the day you sin, you will, the day you sin, you will die. But before sin, there was no death. You see, death is a consequence of man's sin. But before Adam sinned, no death, that means no meat eating. Because when you eat meat, you're eating a dead animal, right? So that had to be after sin. Not before. 
So just like all the other critters, the T-Rex was vegetarian. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, wow, he ate fruits and vegetables with those big old teeth? Yeah, absolutely, because those teeth are perfect for tearing and ripping into things like pineapples and coconuts. Have you guys ever tried to bite into a coconut? Yeah. Don't try it. It's not a good idea, okay? They're really hard. The T-Rex was pre-equipped to eat those things. Not a problem. He had teeth already in his mouth, right? Besides all that, if you find a critter, a fossil with big, long, sharp teeth, what's the only thing you know for sure about that critter? He's got big, long, sharp teeth. That's all you know for sure. That's all the teeth actually tell you. And guys, there are many examples of animals today in our Genesis 3 messed up world that have big, long, sharp teeth that are primarily or only vegetarian. For example, look at that guy. Look at those teeth. You know he's picked on at school, right? Look at those things. He is vegetarian. Or look at that skull. That skull, look at those big old sharp teeth. That must belong to a vicious meat eater. Well, that skull belongs to a fruit bat. What do you think a fruit bat eats? You guys are smart. And that's your reward for answering correctly. Okay. There you go. Yeah, he eats fruit, absolutely. Or look at this skull right here, those big old long sharp teeth. Front. That must be a vicious meat eater. No, that skull belongs to one of those guys. I'm not sure which one it is, but parents, that picture is more for you. Um, some of y'all might recognize that. Anyway, we'll clean it up. All right, here we go. It belongs to a panda bear. Some of the kids are lost. Like, why is that funny? I don't get it. Um, or look at this skull right here. Look at those big old long saber-tooth-like teeth. You know, that, that skull belongs to something called the Chinese water deer, also called the vampire deer for obvious reasons. You see, in the beginning, perfect creation, no death. You can hang out with the lions and the tigers and the bears, oh my. You can bring a T-Rex home as a pet. It would not be a problem. Just be sure you got enough room, right? But that leads us to the next F, because things have changed. Things are fallen. Say fallen. 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 So what is the first F again? Form. Second? Fearless. Third? Fallen. Very good. You see, things were perfect, but they're not anymore. The question then becomes, what happened? And guys, I'm sure you've heard about this, or I hope you have, but I'm going to tell you about the saddest day in the universe. You see, God made Adam and Eve, and it was a perfect creation, but he gave them a choice. Why? Because he didn't want them to be puppets. He wanted them to have the ability to love him. So they needed a choice. So he gave them the ability to choose right from wrong. And he told them, in the day you choose the wrong path, if you choose to sin and disobey me, you will surely die because death was a consequence. But he gave them a choice to make love possible. And of course, along comes the devil. And he tried to trick Eve. And the question he asked Eve was a very simple question. He asked her, did God really say? You see what he was trying to do? He said, did God really say? He's getting her to try to question God's word and reject the word of God. And she did, and she gave some. She gave to him, some to her husband. He gave the fruit as well, and they rebelled against God. And that's called a three-letter word. What is that word? Sin. sin. And because of that sin, we were separated from God. And guys, because we are all descendants from Adam and Eve. By the way, just in case you didn't know, we'll talk about this next session with the teenagers, but there's only one race, the human race, because we all descend from Adam and Eve. But because we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, we're all sinners by nature and by choice. And that's why we all need a Savior. You know, the thing is, if we're sinners, we can't be around God because He's perfect and He's holy. So our sin has to be dealt with, but how can we do that? I'll tell you here in a second. But when they sin, death came into the world. They realized something was wrong. They tried to cover up their nakedness with fig leaves. But God noticed that wasn't good enough, so he killed an animal. The first death enters the world to provide garments of skin to cover their sin and their shame. That was the first blood sacrifice. And guys, that was a picture of Jesus Christ, who is called the Lamb of God, who would die for us and shed his blood to cover our sin and our shame. That if we put our faith in him, we can be saved and our sin will be paid for. And we can live with God forever. And guys, that is the most important decision you will ever make in your entire life, making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And that's how you can be saved. You see, the Bible is very clear that it was a perfect world, but because of man's sin, death came into the world. And that's why we see stuff like this in the world today. Animals eating one another. That sin affected everything. It affected the rocks and the dirt and the animals. It affected the whole universe. Romans 8.22 says the whole of creation, it groans in pain. It wants to be fixed back to the way it was before Adam's sin. But it's because of that sin that we get sick. You ever been sick before? Is that fun? 
No, no, that's not fun at all. Uh, tsunamis, tornadoes, the reason people die is because of sin. But kids, I'm going to tell you something. And parents, this is a really for you in a big way. If you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, you get some big theological problems with the rest of Scripture. Because you see, in the rock record, which according to the evolutionists was laid down millions of years before man evolved in total contra contradiction to the Bible, we find evidence of animals eating each other. But wait, the Bible says originally everything was vegetarian. We find evidence of diseases like tumors and cancer and arthritis. But wait, the Bible says God looked down on day six and called everything very good. God would not call millions of years of death and suffering very good. If he did, he wouldn't be a very good God. We find thorns in the fossil record, supposedly hundreds of millions of years old. But the Bible says thorns came after the curse. And most important of all, parents and teachers, please hear me on this. If you have death before sin, then death is not the payment for sin. And if, you, and if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death would not cover our sin debt. And we're still lost in our sins. And that's why this is such a theological foundational issue, not a side issue. But that's why we're so passionate about it. It's not until after Adam sinned that the diet of dinosaurs would change. They would eat other things like so many other animals. They might have a barbecue afterwards and eat something like that. It's not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I give you plants to eat, now you can eat everything. Which, by the way, boys and girls, that's why you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything, okay? It's, in case you didn't know, it's made up of everything. But anyway, that's a different, different talk. Um, it's not until after the flood that God told Noah, I'm going to put the fear and dread of you. So before the flood, animals weren't scared of man, but after the flood, animals are scared of man. Now, guys, if an animal is scared of you, what two things does it do? Yell them out. Just yell them out. Run. There you go. I heard them. Run or attack, right? So keep that in mind for later. Right? We'll talk about that then. But after Adam's sin, you know how bad sin is? Within one generation, Adam and Eve, they had Cain and Abel. And then what did Cain do? Kill he killed his brother Abel. And then the whole world was filled with evil. And God said enough. He decided to judge the world with a flood. There was one good man that he found. What, what was that man's name? Noah. Noah. He told Noah to build an ark. And that leads us to the next F, which is flood. Say flood. 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 So let's go through the Fs again. Everybody, take a, sit up straight. Take a deep breath. Hands by your side. You ready? What's the first F? Formed. Formed. Second F? Fierce. Good. Third F? Formed. Very good. Latin. The next one? Flood. Now, some people think, okay, Mr. Osborne, well, maybe... God let all the dinosaurs die during the flood because they were now a menace, right? But you know what? Is that what the Bible says? It starts with the Bible. Does Genesis 7.15 say this? All creatures with the breath of life except dinosaurs entered the ark. Does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. Parents, that is found in second opinions, not in the Bible. All right? Parents of all creatures with the breath of life came to Noah. That means dinosaurs were on the ark. Somebody said, well, Mr. Oswald, well, how do you get dinosaurs on the ark? As a matter of fact, how do you get all those animals onto the ark? We hear that question a lot. So let's answer both of those questions, all right? How do you get all those animals onto the ark? I hear this all the time. And when people ask me how you get all those animals onto the ark, I usually ask them two questions of my own. I say, okay, well, how big was the ark? Most of the time people say, I don't know. I ask them, how many animals did Noah actually take? Most of the time they say, I don't know. So let's figure that out. What are the answers? First of all, how big was the ark? Do you think the ark looked like A or B? B. B, yes, definitely more like B. Can I tell you guys a secret? Can I tell you a secret? Yeah. Okay. I hate something, but it's not a person. I hate these little bathtub arks. I hate them. And do you know why? Because when we show pictures of arks like that, that tells people like me and you and other kids that Noah's ark was just a fairy tale. I mean, could that ark survive a global flood? No. no, it can survive a swimming pool, right? That's a terrible ark. And that convinces people that the Bible is not true. And I want people to know that the Bible is true. So I hate these bathtub arks. So I like to destroy the bathtub ark. Would you guys like to destroy the bathtub ark with me? Yeah. Yes. We're good, because we're going to do it. We're going to run over this bathtub ark with the real ark. Okay? So I'm going to count it down from three two, one, and then we'll say, and when the ark hits the bathtub ark, we'll all yell, yay, because we're happy it's sinking, all right? That's what we're happy about. So here we go, you ready? Three, two, one, yay! You're not nearly as excited as I am. Let's do that again, all right? You ready? Three, two, one, 
but there was room. There was a global judgment, but God provided a way of salvation. I got news for you. If you don't know, there's another global judgment coming one day. There's only one way to be saved. Jesus says, I am the door. If you enter by me, if you put your faith in me, you will be saved. And you know, so we know for sure that dinosaurs were on the ark. There they are running towards it. They don't want to die in a flood. Who can blame them? There's the inside of the ark. More than likely, we're building this. Really cool. We have some displays all through the museum about the ark. They're so pretty. That's one of the we have. And of course, the ark was a picture of salvation through Christ. I just mentioned that. But the Bible says this. Once they got on the ark, we talked about this last night. If you didn't get a chance to come, it says, On that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. That refers to water underneath the crust of the earth. It means the crust cracked open and moved dramatically because an earthquake, tsunami, volcanic activity on a scale we can't fathom. It'd be enough to destroy the world. And to give you a better idea of what that was like, I want to show you a video that we showed in the museum. It's called the Flood Initiation. This is probably more like how the flood really was during the time of Noah. Watch this video. It's pretty awesome. Think, you know, for the evolutionists, they can't explain this. 
how do these bones still have fresh tissue? That should not be after millions of years. But I think the Bible gives us a much better explanation. These dinosaurs died not that long ago during a global flood. Yeah. And then dinosaurs were on the ark. Some were on the ark. That means they must have got off the ark, right? They had their picture taken. And they made t-shirts saying, I survived the flood. Because that's what you do after a major event, right? But if that's the case, then shouldn't we find some written historical documentation of man living with dinosaurs after the flood? And indeed we do. But remember the word dinosaur is a new word. Not invented until when? 1841. Say it one more time. 1841. Good job. But there's another word in pretty much every culture all around the world that seems to be talking about dinosaurs. And what is that word? It is dragons. These dragon legends are all over the world, literally everywhere. The honest evolutionist knows this. Watch this clip from the Discovery Channel. There is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, even the Inuits who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found. Even they have stories of this animal. The dragon. Cultures from different continents, people who had no contact with one another, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. Could it be these stories were more than myth? What if we discovered that this creature that haunts our imagination had once been real? This is such a cool thing to talk about. We'll give you a few examples before we start to wrap up here. St. George is said to have killed a dragon around 275 AD. The description of the dragon that he killed, it sounds like the, a dinosaur known as Baryonyx. And it just so happens, in that same area, we find bones of Baryonyx, which is really neat. There's a city in France that was renamed in honor of the dragon that was killed there. It was described as being bigger than an ox with long, sharp pointed horns on its head, maybe a triceratops. There's a guy named Marco Polo, not the game in the pool, but there's a guy named Marco Polo. He lived in China around 1271 AD. He reported that the emperor in China used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. And how cool is that, right? That'd be awesome. Or there are historians, well-known people in the past, people like Aristotle, you may not be familiar with the name Herodotus, but well-known historians, who reported seeing flying dragons. Herodotus said he went to go see these flying dragons as they were flying through Egypt, and he saw them, and he said they were like water snakes. In other words, they were like reptiles. And their wings, their wings, they weren't feathered. They were membranes, like the wings of a bat, which is really cool. And we see drawings and carvings all over the world that seems to be depicting dinosaurs with man, right? Here's a piece of Egyptian pottery that seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. Here's an ancient Roman mosaic from the 2nd century AD, again, two long-necked dinosaurs. You can go to northern England and go to Carlisle Cathedral, visit the tomb of Bishop Bell. And there we see, around this tomb, he died around 1500, about 500 years ago, there's brass strips with carvings of animals. And some of those carvings look like known types of dinosaurs. Or go to this temple in Cambodia, zoom in on the column of this temple, you have what appears to be a clear carving of a stegosaurus. You know, the dinosaur with the plates on the back. Come closer to home over in Colorado. He have a pictogriff, what appears to be a triceratops, big body, three horns. And the evolutionist says, no, it's just a goat. The Indians are just really bad artists. <laughs> but if you look above, they know what a goat looks like, all right? They're not confused. They've got that. But close to there, and I hope you notice these are all around the world. Close to there, we find another drawing of what is clearly a long necked dinosaur. You see the long tail and the four legs, long neck and the head. Long necked dinosaur. And an evolutionist says, yep, yeah, it looks like a dinosaur. I don't know what to do with it. It doesn't fit my worldview, but that's what it looks like. And here's another cave drawing of a long-necked dinosaur. I want to so you can see it better. Here's one of a pterodon, one of the flying reptiles in Utah as well. These things are literally all around the world. Over in Australia, the Aboriginal people drew this picture of a critter they call Yabru. And this picture is kind of sad and funny at the same time, I guess, in a demented way. But inside of Yabru is one of their friends. Can you see the friend? And they're trying to get their friend back or give revenge. But they said Yahweh was a real creature who, did, you know, who was a threat to them. And they drew this picture of Yahweh. Guys, these legends are all around the world. In many cases, they sound just like the dinosaurs. But we don't really hear about this today, do we? I mean, when you guys drove in today, when you came in today with your parents, did you see a sign like this? Were you worried about a dinosaur jumping out in front of you? No. Why? Because that leads us to the next F, faded. Everybody say faded. Faded. So here we go. Let's go through the heads. What's the first one? Four. Four. Second. Fearless. Third. Five. Fourth. Five. Flood. And the next one? Faded. Faded. You see, this leads us to the really big question people ask me all the time. 
Mr. Osborne, what happened to the dinosaurs? I'm going to tell you. You ready? This is really deep and complicated. They died. <laughs> so many creatures go extinct in this fallen, messed up world that we live in. But we'll talk about why here in a second. But according to the evolutionists, they got lots of theories as to why they think the dinosaurs died, right? Something they did not actually die. Something they turned into birds. That's right. They think dinosaurs evolved into birds. That makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> now guys, to turn a dinosaur into a bird requires a complicated process that's impossible to do. You have to add new genetic information over time. Nothing does that. This is absolutely impossible. But if it were possible, I would get worried during Thanksgiving because what's your turkey going to look like? I don't know, right? That'd be scary, right? Some scientists think the dinosaurs died from indigestion, which can be painful. Uh, some secularists believe they overate. Some evolutionists believe they starved to death. Some think a meteorite hit the earth and killed all the dinosaurs big and small but left everything else alive, which is a really cool trick. Some think an ice age killed all the dinosaurs. We can go on and on. they got a bunch of different theories. Well, what's the real reason that dinosaurs went extinct? Well, you know what? Animals go extinct all the time today for some of the very same reasons. The environment's changing, genetic mutations over time, man's affecting the environment, all sorts of reasons. Dinosaurs probably died out for some of the very same reasons as other critters die out. But I'll give you two big problems, I think, for dinosaurs after the flood. Two big ones. The first problem will be this. A sort of climate change. And not the type of climate change you hear about today. Now, we're talking about God-induced climate change. If you go to Genesis 6.13, before the flood, God told Noah his goal with the flood was to destroy both them that would be the people, and the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to destroy this world. Do you realize that we live on a junkyard compared to what it used to be before the flood? And I don't know if you know this, but before the flood, people lived to be over 900 years of age. And then after the flood, just 400, then just 200, then just 100 years, and then under 100 for the most part. People didn't live near as long after the flood. Why? Well, at least part of the reason it was a wrecked world, a different environment. You probably have different foods, lack of foods after the flood. After the flood, it's the perfect time for an ice age, which would not be good for dinosaurs as well. Lots of reasons. Probably many dinosaurs died a few hundred years after the flood during this uh, hard time for the environment. But there's a bigger problem for dinosaurs after the flood, and that's this. People are going to hunt them. I say people hunt dinosaurs? Absolutely, because remember what we said like a little while ago, God put the fear and dread of people into all the animals, right? So let's say, after the Tower of Babel, when God split the people into different people groups from different languages all over the world, but they all go back to one man and one woman, not only just one race, but they spread out and they're isolated by languages and so forth and so on. But as you move to a new area, let's say your people, you run into a new area and you run into a wild herd of poodles. Are they dangerous? Yeah. No, right? They're fluffy. They're not dangerous, all right? Kind of annoying, but there they are. Okay, so they're poodles. They're there. If you move to a new area, though, and in this area, there are some T-Rexes roaming around. Is that dangerous? Yes. Yes. So, hey, kids, what are your parents going to do? Either move or run or kill them. You know what? Because, guys, I don't know about your parents. I make a safe bet, though. I have a son, and I love him dearly. I'm not letting anything eat my wife or my son. I love them too much. So if we move to a new area and there's a threat, me and the other guys, we're going to get together and we're going to kill the threat. That's what people do all over the world. That's why tigers are going to sink over in Asia. All over the world, we kill the threat. Why? Because we love our families. We love you guys. And so humans are going to do the same thing with dinosaurs. You're going to kill dinosaurs because they're a menace, right? You kill them because, for, oh, there I am. For the big dinosaurs, if, if you kill them, that's a lot of meat to feed a lot of people. Uh, competition for land, just to prove superior. And you know what? Let's be honest. Are any of your parents hunters in here? Any hunters in here? Are your parents are? Okay, mom, dad, either one, both. All right, very good. Guys, don't you think that if T-Rexes were around today, your dad would want a T-Rex head hanging on his wall? <laughs> right? That would be really cool. All right? Not like that sound. That would be really cool. You see, guys, here's the thing. Bottom line, dinosaurs are also, no doubt, but they are not a mystery. There now. When you start with God's word, we understand dinosaurs. As so that leads us to this next F, they were found. Everybody say found? Found. found. So here we go. Set them straight. All the F, not well, the first six, not all seven. What's the first F? Four. 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 Next one. Curious. Good. Third? Four. Next? Four. Four. 
Next. Faded. And then they were? Found. They were found. You see, dinosaurs, some say they were discovered first in the 1800s. That's when they were rediscovered. Who found the first dinosaur? Adam. Adam found the first dinosaur. But in the evolution was say, but wait, dinosaurs lived millions of years before man. And when they say that, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, what question do you ask? Or you say it again? You can do better than that one more time louder. Nice, there you go. Good job. For you there. And you see, a lot of people don't want to believe this because they don't want to believe the Bible's history. Because if the Bible's true, that means they have to acknowledge God as their Lord and Savior. And they don't want to do that because we're rebellious by our very nature. And because of that, can you just turn it off? That'll be fine. People invent a lot of friction, of fiction. A lot of fiction. Not friction, but fiction. Remember what does fiction mean? Not true. Not true. What's fiction mean? Not true. We see a lot of this today. So here are all seven F's. You ready? Here we go. What's the first one? Four. Next. Lots of fiction. You know, if you take a book like this, it says, I can read about dinosaurs. What do you think of the first words in the book? You guys have this book. All right. Millions of years ago. Here's another book. Millions of years ago. Even the beloved Dr. Seuss. Millions of years ago. That's a lot of fiction. That's everywhere. That teaches people God's word is the truth. That is a lie. Even at great museums, or at least supposedly good ones like this one at the Indianapolis Children's Museum, supposedly one of the best in the world, they teach that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. It's all over the place. This dinosaur lived millions of years ago. Millions of years ago. Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. This was millions of years old. Millions of years. Millions of years. And Dr. Names who believe the Bible is not true. Millions of years. Millions of years. This is millions of years old. That's millions of years old. This is millions of years old. That's millions of years old. Millions of years. 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 Do you know that was all in just one room? I hope you are glad there's a museum that teaches the real history of the universe called the Gracious and the Master. There's a couple others, too. And you know what, guys? Here's the thing. I like to think of dinosaurs as missionary lizards. What are they? Missionary lizards. Missionary lizards. You say that's silly, but why? Well, here's the thing. Because when we properly understand dinosaurs, they show us God's word is true. It's true about everything it talks about. History and salvation. You can trust them for everything. Also... We would agree. When we should find dinosaur balls today, would you guys agree with me that ball is dead? Is it dead? Yes. yes, it's dead. And from a biblical perspective, why is death in the world? Three letter word. Sin. sin. You know, the Bible says very clearly that the wages of sin is death. And that all have fallen short of God's glory. In other words, everyone has sinned. And you know what? If you don't know this, I'll tell you secrets. God wants you to be perfect. He doesn't want you to ever lie. Ever seen. In order to get to heaven, you have to be perfect. No lying, no stealing, no tap. I mean, no, perfect. And also, your thoughts. You can never have a bad thought. And all your motives must be perfect. You might say, but wait, Mr. Osborne, I can't do that. Nobody can. You know what? You're right. Nobody can. That's really bad news. But that's why the good news is so good. That if you will trust Jesus, that God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for me and for you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, make Jesus your Lord, your God, and your King. And believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And that's what this is all about. We use dinosaurs to share the gospel. Because boys and girls, I'll tell you a secret. You ready? I'm going to give you the meaning of life. That's deep, isn't it? You are here on this planet for two reasons. You ready? Everybody look at me. You're here for two reasons. To know God and to make him known. That's why you exist. To know Him, to have a relationship with Him, and to make Him known. That's why He made you and He loves you. That is why you are here. So let's go through the F's one more time. This is the last preparation before we have the final test. Okay? So, deep breath. And I just want you to say one and then say the other. I won't do any you know, coaching. Just one, two, three, just down the line. You ready? So what's the first one? Four. Four. Four.
want to learn more about dinosaurs, if you want to share this with friends who are not here, we've got some stuff in the back that you can look at and give for people. It's really good. We've got a book about dinosaurs. And this book goes through these seven Fs like we did today, but in more detail. It talks about more cool stuff. We got a book about dragon legends back there as well, talking about how these dragon legends sound like dinosaurs all over the world. We've got a book about these for dinosaur for your younger brothers and sisters to go through and learn about dinosaurs. For the older uh, siblings, for the older kids, for the adults, we have books called the Answers Books. Each one of these books answers 25 to 35 of the most asked questions in our culture today. It's an incredible resource to answer the skeptical questions of the day, to defend our faith, equip your kids to defend their faith so they won't fall away like two-thirds are and stand boldly should the gospel fall in us. We've got answers books for kids, great for uh, your kids or for grandkids. All right? We've got books about why are so many kids leaving the church. Parents, over two-thirds of kids are walking away from the church by the time they reach college age. And that's from conservative churches. Why is that happening? What can we do to stop it? The book Already Gone is all about that. We got a book, we got a video about dinosaurs. We got similar to this, but it's Ken Ham, our president, and Buddy Davis singing songs with that of animation. It's really awesome. We got a special here at the conference. It's called the You Choose Special. You can buy any combination of books or DVDs. And the more you buy, the more you save. You can buy as much as you want, up to 30 items from $199 at $650 per item. But buy any one of those, any combination of books or DVDs. There's a magazine we have, my wife's favorite thing that we do. It is over uh, 90 pages long. It talks about biblical authority issues. There's a kid's edition inside each one. And there's my son reading the kid's edition. Take it out, all right? Isn't he cute? I think it's cute. I'm fine. All right, but anyway, there he is. And uh, for each of you subscribe to the magazine, you get a free DVD, which is a really good deal. You can sign up for the free newsletter. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter if you guys are curious about that. We all do blogs and so forth and so on. And speakers are available to speak at churches. Literally all over the world, parents, if you're curious about that. Then I'm going to leave you with the, the S one more time. This is the final test. Are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, let's sit up straight. Deep breath. Hands by your side. You ready? What's the first step? Four. Second. Yes. Third. Five. Fourth. Big hand. Nice job. Guys, one last thing. I hope you guys realize this. The Bible is the history book of the universe. You can trust it when it talks about history. You can trust it when it talks about salvation. If you guys got any questions, I'd love to talk with you. I'll be back in the back. I'd love to help you guys out. We've got about 15 minutes before. We're 10 minutes before we start the next session, but I'm so glad you're here. Hopefully you come back for tonight or bring friends. We'll do that. We'll here for the adults tonight and then talk about how do we shoot music and share the gospel in our culture today. Two real good talks tonight if you can make it for that. Glad you're here. I'll see you guys later. I'm towards the back. Thanks for being here. See you guys.